Um, uh, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the May CTCFT for uh, 2022. Um, this week, we have uh, quite a few speakers and quite a large audience, so I'm going to try to keep my sections as uh, short as possible. So uh, just starting off, of course, uh, we're following the Rust Code of Conduct, and uh, we, we have several moderators that uh, will will be on hand in the chat, um, as well as you like people you can reach out to afterwards. Uh, you can always uh, send us an email to our uh, CTCFT at, at, at rustlang.org, I believe. <laughs> um, so uh, that is good. Um, and just a reminder with camera and audio. Uh, so when possible, just make sure that you are muted and your camera is off. Uh, if you are speaking or asking a question, of course, feel free to turn it on. And uh, we'll try to relay as much as we can uh, for any questions from the chat to, to the speakers. And so if you're more comfortable with that, um, that should be all right. Um, so as for the agenda, as always, we're looking for uh, people to come and give talks about the uh, the topics with, that, that fit within the theme. And so this month is uh, focused on embedded Rust. And uh, for June, I believe we've settled on global being the theme. But if you have any ideas of what could be uh, talks for uh, next month, do feel free to reach out and submit proposals. Um, we also do some work to try and find people that we think would do uh, quite well. Um, but we always want to make sure that we, we keep it open for anybody to suggest. Um, so uh, we'll get started right away. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to our first speaker who is going to give us a uh, whirlwind tour of Embedded Rust. And so, uh, James, I'll pass it over to you. OK, great. I'm not sure if you can see or hear me. Yes, we can see and hear I you. And then, uh, yeah, if you want to give that a try, we can make sure that works. Yeah, it says I can't while you're uh, sharing. Let me do this and also make sure we have permission set up properly. Uh, yeah, give that a go. Okie dokie. Let me switch my webcam Perfect. so I have a slightly more flattering angle. <laughs> All right. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. All right. Let me pull something onto my main screen real quick. All right. So, uh, hey. I'm James. Um, this is going to be a whirlwind tour of embedded Rust, and I have a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. Um, I've been part of the embedded working group for forever, I guess, until since it started. Um, and I've given a talk about what is embedded Rust a lot of times. So I decided to mix it up and go full uh, out there on this one and try and explain a lot of things, but also show a lot of things. And uh, if you don't follow all the details of what I'm doing, that's totally okay. I'm gonna post this up in a Git repo afterwards, once I polish it up a little bit, including with all the pictures and stuff like that. So um, if you don't follow along, don't worry. My main gist here is that developing embedded systems with Rust is more like developing Rust than developing embedded systems. And if you are already someone who can develop Rust, you probably would have a really good time developing embedded systems. So before I talk about anything else, I should probably define my terms. What are embedded systems? Um, embedded systems are, my joking answer is, every computer you don't sit in front of. This is every computer that typically has one specific purpose rather than being a general purpose computer. Now your desktop, your laptop, a server, your phone, I would call those general purpose computers because you can run any kind of program on them. Embedded systems typically have exactly one program that they run. This could be something like your fitness band or a treadmill or a TV remote or all the parts that make up a Tesla, for example. Um, so these are all systems that have different constraints. Some of them have to be really fast. Some of them have to be really reliable. Some of them have to be both. Um, but these are all the systems that have really large constraints on them and they're designed to do exactly one thing. So why is Rust a good match for embedded systems? Well, embedded systems tend to be made as close to the requirements as possible, which means you want to put the smallest CPU and the smallest amount of RAM there, because when you're making a million of them, it costs the least. Or when you have to deliver on some kind of deadline, you want to make sure that it's going to never take more than exactly this amount of time not just statistically, but never, never, because it might be responsible for keeping someone safe. And you really don't want the system 
that is preventing you from sticking your hand in some blades or something from having a garbage collection pause right as that happens, because then it's going to be a little late to turning off the blades, and that's no good. And Rust is great for this because it lets you design with that kind of control. If you want to control exactly how you allocate memory, you can. If you want to control exactly what you're doing in different environments and contexts and things like that, you can. Even though Rust was never designed, at least from the beginning, to be an embedded systems language, it has the same kind of design constraints as something like a browser or an operating system where you need to be the one as the developer who controls all of those things. Now, embedded systems are in Rust, but the Rust that we use for embedded systems is a little bit of a different environment than you might be used to if you've mostly built for desktop or server or even the compiler itself. Now, most of these operating systems don't or excuse me, most of these embedded systems don't have an operating system. They run one application and the application is both the program and the operating system, which means that we can't use the standard library in Rust usually. There's all kinds of different embedded systems. Like I said, a Tesla might have less constraints than your TV remote, but most of the time when we're talking about embedded systems, we're talking about systems without an operating system. Now, Rust is really great because it's broken up the standard library into core, alloc and standard. And most of the fun parts are actually in core, which means we still get to use iterators and all of those great things. Now, because we don't have an operating system, as a software developer, we have to bring our own platform bits, which means we have to handle what happens between powering the system on and running our program. Now, when you develop for a desktop, you typically think of it like this. You have some code, it's on your hard drive. You open it up uh, in the compiler. The compiler compiles that code, creates an application, and then you ask your operating system to load that program and run it. So it's going to, look, can I make this bigger? Cool. Um, so it's going to go ahead and load that program and run it. And you are both building and running that program on the same machine. Now, lots of folks out there have probably developed for servers too. And we're getting a little bit closer here, and you'll see why I'm going down this direction in a second. When you're developing for a server, either somewhere else or you know, in a virtual machine, you're building your code locally, and then you're deploying it typically over the network. So you're pretty much pushing your application over there, and then maybe through SSH or some tool, you're getting the logs back. So again, now you're in kind of a two computer world where one computer is where you're compiling and one's where you're running. Now in embedded systems, this gets a little bit more detailed because like I said, we have no operating system. We can't just ask the operating system to run a program for us. So we do what's called cross compiling. We are taking our code that's running on our desktop, compiling it into an application, but for a different architecture. Instead of for our machine, it's for our little microcontroller machine. And then instead of being able to SSH or remote into it, we need to use a tool called a debugger to upload it. Because like I said, no operating system. So we're going to manually control the hard drive on that microcontroller and put the application directly there and say, go, which allows us to go ahead and run the code on a different computer. Uh, da, 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 I think that's all I have for this. So again, the difference is we're building here. We've got to get it to the embedded system and then we've got to run it there. Now, the other thing that's really great about embedded Rust is we still get to use all of the great tools from Rust. We get to use tools like Cargo Generate and Rust, or excuse me, Cargo plugins that allow us to make running an embedded system feel a lot easier. So I'm actually going to go ahead and plug in some hardware. And you can't see it, but that's OK. But for the sake of demonstration, I don't know how visible this will be. I have a tiny embedded system here. Um, it's a little microcontroller. It's 64 megahertz. It's got eight kilobytes of RAM and 64 kilobytes of storage. And it's going to be our test subject today. So can you see the different window with the console on it? Can someone give me a confirm? Yes. So it still showing? Cool. All right. So I'm not going to show you all of the code because I realized that I have much less time than I think. So we're going to fast forward. and You'll have to trust me on some of these things. But I used a tool called uh, Cargo Generate 
to make a template of an application for me. And it went ahead and set up everything except for the parts that are specific to exactly what hardware I'm running on. It set up the tooling, it set up a bunch of things like that, which now means that when I want to run my program, all I need to do is do cargo, run, uh, release, binary, hello. Binary. Has it been? Cargo, RR, RB, hello. And just like on a desktop program, oh, it helps if I plug in that thing that I said needed to be plugged in. The joys of moving from my couch to my office. So now that I've plugged my USB device in, it went ahead and compiled my program for a different architecture, uploaded it, and ran that program for me and gave me the logs back. So with this kind of tooling, we want the experience of writing embedded code to feel a lot like writing code for a server. You're taking code from here and uploading it over there. And our code itself doesn't look too strange. There's going to be a couple attributes you might not have seen before, but we've got a main function. We've got print line. We're able to print some stuff back over our debugger. But once that's running, we get to develop embedded systems in the same way that you would if you were pushing your code to a server somewhere else. Boop, boop, boop. Now, there's a bunch of libraries that go into this, but the thing that I really want to push here, more than any specific details, is that all of this stuff that let me write code for my specific chip isn't something special and bespoke to embedded. I can look in my cargo toml here, and my dependencies for all of my drivers are just Rust crates, which means there's this whole ecosystem of embedded driver development that I can just pull in like a normal application. Um, I've got dependencies. I can use my cargo profiles, everything like that. And I'm able to run my code here. Now, um, one other thing that I really wanted to touch on here is that traditionally, writing portable code for embedded has been very difficult. Most of the time, those drivers that I mentioned, if you're writing them in C or other languages, come from the people who sell you the hardware. They maintain the drivers, and that driver isn't really portable to anything else, which means when you write a lot of your code, it needs to be specific to that one chip. Now, in Rust, we have some lovely, lovely tools for abstraction that let us go much further than that. Now, let's see. The way it works in Rust is we actually have the ecosystem broken up into like three parts. And to make things portable, you might say, well, there's a thing for that in Rust. There are traits. And we've leaned really hard to that in embedded Rust. We have a bunch of traits called embedded HAL traits, which describe a bunch of normal stuff that embedded systems do. Sending data over a serial port, um, reading a GPIO, uh, parsing things and things like that, those are all going to be in embedded how. Now, the way that this gets broken up is we have drivers for specific chips, let's say from a company called Nordic, that says, hey, for the serial port on this chip, it works exactly like this. But I've implemented the interfaces from the embedded how traits. Then someone on the other side can say, well, I want to write a driver that does something like controls LEDs or reads GPS messages, but I don't want it to only work with one piece of hardware. So this library will be generic over anything that implements these traits, which means when I write my little application, all I have to do is set up my hardware, give it over to my portable library, which is generic over anything that works with a serial port, and then runs it. Um, the way that you would typically do this on a desktop would be that you'd have hardware drivers which talk to your operating system and something like your network stack that talks to your operating system and your application is just going to talk to your operating system. But again, no operating system and we can't really handle that much overhead. So we lean really hard on Rust traits because those get compiled down to exactly what we end up using. And the reason that this is really important is that when we're trying to support as an ecosystem, hundreds of chips that you're going to run your code on, 
and hundreds of sensors and things like that that you're going to want to work with your hardware, instead of having to implement those all for each other, they all just work through one common trait interface, which is how in the last three or four years, we've been able to support just a ridiculous number of hardware and external components and things like that, because we don't always have to reinvent the wheel for every project. Now, I think we're actually pretty getting pretty close to the end of my 15 minutes. So I wanted to mention one thing that if you're looking for the kind of things that are possible today, or you want an idea of uh, what kind of code already exists out there, um, the Rust Embedded Working Group has a coordination repository at rust-embedded slash WG. Um, we have a lot of things here. But if you're looking for inspiration, one of my favorite things is the awesome embedded Rust list, which is sort of a community maintained list of all the stuff we have drivers for, people who have written cool blog posts or learning materials or things like that. And even things like a listing of chat rooms where you can find other people who are working on the same kind of problems that you wanna be working on. Now, I didn't have time to go into the code too deeply, but I'm going to end with just a fun little demo of running some light controls because I got it all set up. Um, if I have it, let's see, hello world. Uh, this should... So, you can even do all kinds of things. So this is using one of those embedded HAL drivers to control the LEDs in a portable way with the drivers for this specific chip that are running on here. And you're able to control all kinds of things like LED strips or sensors and things like this. This also does some stuff when I press the buttons, it'll switch the color patterns and things like that. But um, you can see that while I'm doing all of this, I'm getting the logs if I don't short out my board. And it's able to give me debugging information, and I can work with these programs exactly like I do for a desktop. So I know that was a super big crash course, but thank you all for listening. I hope this was interesting to see how we do stuff in Embedded Rust, and hopefully to feel like this is something that is approachable if you have any experience with Rust out there. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you so much. And we'll open the floor for a uh, question or two if anybody likes. Um, I will give that an opportunity. And I think, uh, oh, I see Nico here. Uh, Nico, I'll let you speak. I got a question. Um, this looked really awesome. I'm wondering what are the things that are kind of cutting edge? Like what, what makes embedded, where does the slick tooling start to fall off and where would you, where would you say it needs more work? Yeah, so I mean, the tooling is definitely probably the most innovative thing. Um, embedded tooling in the past has traditionally been a real pain to use because it's bespoke to every piece of hardware you use, which means you don't get to build up a lot around that. In Embedded Rust, we've done a really good job of making it feel like the rest of the Rust ecosystem. Um, there's certainly some longer tail, more challenging things, things like in-depth tracing that might require really expensive hardware. Um, since this is open source and more organically grown, there tends to be wonderful support for the things that everyone buys that are cheap or hobbyist grade and things like that. And there are still some very advanced tooling stuff that would cost you three, four, 5,000 euros to buy, which is out of the reach of most hobbyists, but is kind of the bread and butter of professional engineering sometimes. Um, so there's definitely some longer tail things in embedded and embedded is full of long tail things, but um, the tooling is absolutely a shining star and um, the ecosystem really has been growing over the past years, filling in all of the different pieces of hardware. Um, yeah, and I think just Rust itself, making things available to be used at whatever level you have coming is good because you've got people like this running on a microcontroller with 8K of RAM where I have no heap and anything like that. There are folks like the ESP32 folks who make um, those Wi-Fi microcontrollers where they have much more resources and they even have a real-time operating system based on FreeRTOS and they've implemented the Rust standard library on top of that real-time operating system. So you can even still use the standard library and allocations and things like that on those platforms. So it's been really nice that Rust scales with the amount of uh, power you have available to you. 
Cool. Thanks. Perfect. So I think we'll hop over to our next speaker. Um, thank you so much, James. And just a reminder to everybody uh, in the social hour that will be following um, the presentations today, uh, you can feel free to reach out to any of the speakers and ask any more questions. Um, perfect. So uh, James, uh, yes, okay, perfect. I'll, and then uh, Dario, I will pass it over to you to talk about um, async embedded. So, hello everyone. Uh, I think you can see me. I uh, can't see your camera right now. My camera decided to do strange things on the worst moment. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we okay. go. Perfect. Cool. Let's pray screen sharing works as well. <laughs> yes, looks good. Can, can you see my screen? Yep, all good. Great. So, um, so James did a great presentation on how ACL, how embedded works in general. Um, so I'm going to focus on one aspect which makes Rust awesome for embedded, uh, and is something like uh, people developing embedded with C have like never seen. So in my in my opinion, this is one of the uh, groundbreaking things Rust allows on embedded, which is it allows uh, use of async um, without the typical downsides of like other async runtimes in other languages. Um, so basically, the the talk would be like a short overview or of like how do you usually handle concurrency uh, on embedded systems? Like how do you do multiple things at the same time? So for example, you might have an embedded system which is like blinking a light to indicate some status to the user, and then controlling some motors with some timers, and then handling like USB or serial port for allowing another system to control it. So typically, you, you have like some amount of concurrency in an embedded system, and there's a few ways to handle it. And then, in my opinion, async is like the the best, uh, as we'll see why shortly. So short overview of like how embedded hardware looks like. Uh, we're talking about like really embedded hardware. So embedded microcontrollers, no embedded Linux, uh, where like every single instruction running on it is written by us. So there's absolutely no OS that will do things for us. Uh, they are typically tiny systems like uh, Low end could be considered like 4K of RAM, 16K of flash. Uh, high end would be considered like 256K of RAM, one megabyte of flash, uh, which is like really tiny, even like even high end is really tiny. And something interesting is uh, you use it often like with no heap because you have so little RAM that um, you really need to make sure at compile time that everything you want to do fits in RAM. Uh, so if you have a heap, you can have out of memory errors at runtime uh, versus if you statically allocate everything, you like you cannot have out of memory errors at runtime. Like uh, the linker will lay out everything in RAM and it will fail to link if everything doesn't fit. Also, you can have no fragmentation, which helps you get the most out of the little RAM you do have. Um, so. These embedded microcontrollers are usually what's called a system on a chip, which is like you buy a single chip which contains a CPU core, it contains RAM and flash built in, and then it contains peripherals to allow the CPU core to talk to the external world. Uh, for example, you might have a serial port, you might have a USB device driver, uh, you might have timers, uh, so you can talk to other or other chips in your board, or you can talk to a computer to control your device. And uh, basically, the way it works is um, the peripherals are usually memory mapped, uh, which is like there are special memory locations which are not like RAM or flash, but they allow you access to registers for the peripheral. 
So uh, you write registers to, to tell it to do things. And then you can read back uh, the values of registers. So you can know the status of the stuff you ask the peripheral to do. So uh, the most basic way to do things using these peripherals is uh, just outright blocking. So for example, this is how would you um, do a serial a read on a serial port uh, on an NRF chip from Nordic Semiconductor, which is the same chips uh, James was talking about before. Uh, so these things here are registers. And as you can see, we can write to them or we can read to them. So for example, we allocate a buffer of eight bytes and then we write the pointer and the length uh, to this buffer, to the peripheral. And then we tell it, hey, start a receive, a rex means receive. So we tell the peripheral, hey, start receiving data on this buffer I just gave you. And then there's this other register, which is end receive, which we can read. And this is a bit which gets set when the read is done. Like when the peripheral has finished uh, reading the eight bytes we asked it. So what we do is just, we can simply slip, uh, no, we can spin. While this bit is not set, uh, we spin. Like it's a while loop that does nothing, just waits for this bit to be set. And when it's set, we know the buffer has the data, so we can do things with this data. In this case, we can print it, but in the real world, we would like process it. It would be some control message. We would do things with it. So this works. This is super simple, but it has like some very obvious downsides, uh, which is basically we can do anything else while waiting. It's a loop which is uh, using 100% of the CPU. Uh, and remember, we have no threads here. We have no OS. So there is just one thread. Uh, so while this thread is busy spinning in this loop, nothing else is getting done. We could like maybe put multiple things in this loop. So for example, if we're waiting to receive data on two serial ports, we could make this loop um, uh, check both registers from both serial ports. And then when it gets data from one or the other, process it. But like it composes horribly. Like ideally, ideally we would want we would want to have like a piece of code handling one serial port and another piece of code handling the other serial port, and not having to like mash them together like this. And also, of course, it wastes power. Like the core is spinning and hundred percent usage. So if you're like building, say, battery power devices, which need to be like uh, have years of battery life on a single charge. Uh, this is obviously not, not great. It's really bad. So to solve this, the hardware gives you something called interrupts, which is yet another way peripherals can communicate with you. So basically you can like read or write registers, which is something like the core has to do voluntarily. And there's also interrupts, which is something initiated by the peripheral, not by the core. So the peripheral can signal an interrupt to the core, which basically uh, causes the, the hardware. Uh, so it's not, not, not done by any operating system. It's all done by the hardware. The hardware will like save registers to the stack, jump to the interrupt handler, which is like another piece of code. And then when the interrupt handler returns, it will like restore the registers and it will carry on executing whatever it was executing before. So it's kind of similar to a thread um, because it can like, preempt like the main thread uh, at any time. Um, but it's not exactly like a thread. It runs on the main stack. So it's more like Unix signals, uh, which people familiar with them will know they are very cursed. Uh, but essentially, the, the main uh, takeaway is sending data from main thread to an interrupt, or the other way, requires send and sync. Uh, because it kind of behaves like a threat. So you, you, you have to require send and sync to enforce you don't send data that could 
be vulnerable to risk conditions. So how does it look in practice? So instead of uh, uh, spinning, we do the following. We do some extra magic register writes, which will enable this interrupt, which is basically asking the hardware, hey, when you're done with, like when this event happens, please fire the interrupt. And then we start the read as before. And then instead of actually spinning, uh, waiting for the event, we do nothing. So for example, in ARM cores, there's this instruction, which is called wait for interrupt, which essentially does nothing and waits for an interrupt to arrive. And then if you stick it in a loop like this, basically what you do is you slip the core in low power mode. So this will not use 100% CPU. This will use like the, the lowest power consumption the, the core can do. And then we, we write this magic function um, with this attribute, which uh, makes it be the interrupt handler. So this is the, the thing the hardware will call when the interrupt fires. So note that we're not calling it here. It's the hardware that magically out of nowhere will call this. And then in here, we check the event. And then if it fired, then we can, we, we know the read finished and then we can do stuff with it. Um, so in this case, what I do is print it, but you would carry on processing it. And also something of note is, uh, this is a separate function. Uh, this is not main. So to actually share the data between main and interrupt, I had to move the buffer to a static mood, which is actually cheating. This is uh, unsound because you can have race conditions between main and interrupt. So in the real world, you would have to do even more complex things here, like using mod access to ensure main and interrupt don't access this buffer concurrently. Uh, but yeah, this is for illustrative purposes, like how an interrupt handler looks like. So this works. This solves the issue of uh, spinning the core at 100%. This solves the issue of only being able to do one thing at, the, at a time. Um, but there are some, ch there are still challenges. Uh, the interrupt handler is another threat. So you need to put everything, like all your state, you need to put it in statics and you need to make it send and sync. So you need to use mutexes. And it's also less readable, like um, control flow no longer reads top to bottom. You, you, you have essentially a callback hell from like the old days of JavaScript where it's like, hey, do this thing. And then when the thing fires, like when the thing is done, this callback fires, which is somewhere else in the code. And then from that callback, you need to start then doing the next thing, which we'll call another callback. So the control flow no longer reads top to bottom. It's really, really harder to write code in this way. And you have to turn all your logic into state machines uh, because in, in your interrupts, uh, you cannot block. So in the interrupts, you, you essentially need to load all your state from statics. You need to update the state, do the next thing, and then store all the state back in the statics. Uh, so you essentially have to write all your code as state machines. And also, it's really complex to like actually wait for multiple things. Uh, so, uh, for example, if we wanted to uh, do this serial read with a timeout, we would need to have like the serial interrupt. We would need to use a hardware timer with the timer interrupt. And then for example, when the serial read completes, we would need to stop the timer. Or when the timer fires, we would need to stop the serial read. So there's an example in the GitHub for the code of this talk that you can uh, check later uh, if you want. It shows how complex this gets. Also, there's kind of complex race conditions that can happen uh, if both interrupts fire at the same time. So you need to use atomics and, and things. So it's it's not great. It works, but it's not great. So in C embedded development, traditionally to solve these issues, you use what's called a real-time operating system. 
which is basically a mini operating system that you ship with your code. It's mostly a library. It's not a, a real operating system. So you, you link it together with your code. So you get one binary that then you flash it to the chip. It's basically a mini library that gives you multiple threads. So each thread has its own stack and you have a small kernel that schedules and then does uh, context switching across threads. Um, it gives you mutexes, semaphores, channels. So for example, if a thread is waiting on a mutex, it knows the thread can do no longer, it can no longer do useful work. So it will deschedule the thread and switch to some other thread. Uh, most of the mature RTOSs are written in C. You have some examples here. There's a few upcoming uh, projects in Rust, just talk OS or Habris. Uh, there's also bindings to C RTOSs. There's even a few STD ports, um, usually on top of C RTOSs. But even then, like RTOSs solve this issue, but they are still not great. So for example, you need to allocate stacks for every thread. Uh, which a common pain point is you have to actually set a size for these stacks. Uh, if you set them too big, you're wasting RAM. If you set them too small, you will have stack overflow errors at runtime, which could cause a different behavior depending on how you, how you have configured memory protection. Um, so Rust gives us, in my opinion, the ultimate solution to embedded concurrency, which is async which basically um, in async, we have this trait called future, which allows us to abstract an operation which is in progress. Um, so what we do is we wrap uh, the hardware, um, uh, we, we wrap the hardware registers and interrupts into futures. So for example, when we pull this future, we, check if the event happened. And then if the event fired, we return ready. And if it didn't happen, we return pending. So the executor will pull us again. And then on the interrupt, basically all we do is we fire the waker. So uh, the, um, for those of you who are not familiar with icing internals, the waker is a way to signal the icing executor that um, that there's work to do in this task. And the, then the, 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 the future registers the waker in a global. So here, the only communication between main and interrupt is this static, which uh, is atomic. So we, we, have to, we don't have to worry about risk conditions. And then once we have all this machinery in place, we can simply wait for a read done. So we start an operation, we await the future, and then uh, and then that's it, it works. And also the, the executor uh, will handle sleeping. So the executor, if it's properly written for embedded, uh, will make sure the core sleeps when no task has to run. So um, for the last few years, I've been working in a project together with many people from the awesome Rust embedded community, uh, which is called Embassy, which is taking all these ideas into an actual production ready framework for using async on embedded. And then this is a quick peek of what it allows you to write. Uh, so we basically get this driver for UART for a serial port, and then we can simply do a read with it. So we can await it or we can, even, we can even raise the future with a timeout future. So the, the thing I was mentioning before, we, where if you need to wait for multiple things, you need to coordinate the interrupts and everything, uh, all this is handled for you, for you with async. So the, the futures nicely encapsulate waiting for a read or waiting for a timeout, and then you can combine them with join, with select. Um, so in practice, this gives you smaller code than RTOSs faster because you don't need an actual OS that handles context switching. So the compiler translates all your code to a state machine for you. Uh, it's readable, so the code reads top to bottom. The data stays in a single task, so you don't need 
uh, mutexes or statics or sentence sync anymore. And yeah, it composes nicely, as you can see here with, with timeout, for example. So uh, to bring this to production, uh, it works great. It's usable in production. My company is shipping all our products using Rust async and embassy, for example. Um, but there's a few challenges. The, 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 main, the main challenge is uh, everything is needs uh, nightly only features. So for example, we want the execute to be no alloc. So it stores features in static variables. And for that, you need to be able to name the type of the features. And the features return from async functions is unnameable. So we use type alias input rate, which is nightly only feature. Uh, we need async traits as well. So in the ecosystem, there's currently an, a crate called async trait, which is a proc macro that will desugar your async traits using box, like it will box the features, but we cannot use it here. It needs alloc and we want to use no, no alloc. So we use generic, generic associated types uh, together with type alias input trait to name the unnameable features from async functions again. Um, but of course, the Rust uh, async team is already working on this. So we'll hopefully get uh, async function in traits soon. Uh, I invite you to check embedded hull async uh, to see like how these traits look today and how great could they look like with real async function in traits support. Um, because yeah, they work, but they're not very readable. And this is the biggest challenge we're having in embedded async. And I would say in embedded in general, if you want to use DMA, direct memory access. So um, as you've seen in this early example here I had, uh, we give a buffer to the hardware. And then the hardware will actually do memory writes to this buffer uh, using the DMA, which is called uh, direct memory access. Uh, which means it's the, it's the hardware itself which is doing memory writes to this buffer. Um, and the problem is if we start this operation and then we deallocate the buffer, for example, we return from this function, um, this will cause undefined behavior because the hardware will continue writing to this buffer, which, which is not now deallocated. So, one way to solve it would be to make the future stop the DMA on drop. Um, so the, the, the way to cancel a future is you just drop it and then the, the drop implementation for the future can do whatever cleanup it needs. But there's a huge problem, which is in today's Rust, you can leak instances of structs, uh, which means you can deallocate them without calling their drop. Uh, which you can use this uh, to cause undefined behavior in, in, in these future APIs that use DMA internally. So this is actually the same problem as uh, IO U-Ring bindings. So IO U-Ring uh, is a new IO API in the Linux kernel, which is essentially the Linux kernel doing uh, writes to the process memory uh, so it's kind of like DMA, but done by the kernel. Uh, and they have exactly the same problems. So the, they, 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 they solve this by using owned buffers. Um, so this way, if you leak the future, you also leak the buffer. So the memory for the buffer will stay located forever. And then the kernel can keep writing to it. And it won't, it won't cause UB. But this is not possible in embedded if you want to use no alloc. Like you cannot use box or BEC. So there's a few ideas around on how to solve this. Um, uh, I, I think I'm running out of time. So one of them is to use uh, run to completion features. So you would forbid dropping them halfway. Another issue and another idea is to use a leak or a trait. So everything that can leak things uh, would require this trait. And then you could not implement for features that must not be leaked. 
But yeah, it's a very, very open question. And I would really love to see a solution for this from Rust. Uh, because currently, for example, in Embassy, we're just pretending this issue doesn't exist. So we're just saying, hey, please don't leak futures. Uh, but yeah, it's not, not great. So it could be improved. So that's about it. Uh, thanks, everyone. You, you can check out the full code for these slides on GitHub. Also, I invite you to check out Embassy to see how all these ideas are applied in a production-ready framework. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think because of time, we'll keep questions to the chat. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of discussion going on in there. And so it's really great to see that so many people are excited about uh, a lot of stuff that was discussed. Um, so. Uh, thank you so much, Dario. And we will hand it over to uh, Christoph for the final presentation of today. Thank you. Um, I'm just wait for <laughs> screen sharing to get live. Perfect. So I hope you can see my screen fine. Yes, all good. OK, so um, I should probably introduce myself uh, because uh, you know Florian, um, who is actually core um, of this talk. Um, I'm Christoph Petich. Uh, I'm now working for 15 years in the automotive industry. And of course, I have written plenty of C and C++ code, embedded and also non-embedded, and optimized for strange uh, target hardwares and things like that. And Two years or two and a half years ago, actually, a coworker of mine introduced me to Rust, um, and I got hooked. I joined the Valorant community to learn uh, Rust, and later on, um, I got the opportunity to work on embedded Rust um, at work. Um, and of course, I'm a big fan of the um, aforementioned uh, Embassy because this is really a game changer when it comes to um, being a, a create readable uh, code for embedded systems. So um, I would like to actually structure this um, talk into three parts. The first one is about explaining what exactly is autos are. You might actually have heard that name before, and I would like to give you a better idea about that. Then I will give um, an introduction, a very quick introduction to functional safety. This is a vast topic. And then uh, Florian can take over for the uh, ferrocene efforts on compiler qualification which the need for that actually should become obvious after the second part. So um, what is AutoZAR? Um, it's not that visible, uh, well visible from these uh, letters here, but actually it's um, made out of odd from automotive, O, S, and R. So it's actually um, an acronym for an open systems architecture for automotive which was created by a lot of OEMs, which is basically the car manufacturers, uh, and the so-called tier ones, which is uh, basically the companies producing um, modules, which are then integrated into these cars. And of course, the um, tier twos and tier threes, which is um, hardware and silicon and tool suppliers and all these. Um, the com uh, the um, consortium is actually Munich based, and it has specified two variants. The classic Autosar variant has been around for more than a decade now. Um, and it's targeting uh, microcontrollers. It has a C API um, and it's in wide use across the industry. And they also specified a newer one, which is uh, less than five years old, as far as I can recall. This is adaptive Autosar. And this one extends um, the AutoZAR architecture towards dynamic um, dispatch. So um, auto, I'm, I would like to concentrate on the non-embedded um, part of AutoZAR, because that is the one which um, currently is being specified for uh, using Rust within. And we would like to address that first, uh, because um, autos are adaptive is still in um, uh, in flux and it is still being worked on actively. 
and the others are classic is more of a frozen state so actually we would like to introduce it first into the more um, volatile environment and then later on go to the classic one because of course um, autos are classic can also benefit from the um, from rust especially when it uh, when you introduce in um, async to actually work around the callback hell which is currently um, present in all of autos are classic so um, autos are adaptive um, relies on a POSIX in, um, system which uh, in my book actually doesn't make it an embedded system and all, all of the system is defined in an XML variant. And it has uh, dynamic communication bindings, which are very similar to DBus, for example, Corbar robot operating system. And the network protocol um, either uses some IP or um, data distribution systems, um, or it just uses locally a shared memory interface. So this is just a quick overview of the many modules, which actually make up autos are adaptive and again actually um, the first letters of these words are, are just uh, taken into an acronym so all of autos are adaptive is typically called error and the most interesting part for me is actually the error com which is a dynamic communication management uh, but of course this has plenty of things inside cryptography um, basically Autozar is a platform, a standardized platform for use within the auto industry. So um, we created a working group um, at, auto, at the Autozar Consortium to work on getting Rust into Autozar adaptive, basically. And we do have a working demonstration of um, static bindings, which um, we just wrap the C++ APIs in C and then call it from Rust code. And for the dynamic bindings, we are currently working on um, a demonstrator and we are defining their API. This is a work in progress. Um, and we will implement actually the services from trades and we would like to use async, which uh, yeah, directly comes to one problem. Um, here's a quick code example. Um, I can get more into later, probably. So I would like to proceed to the second part. So if you actually bring software into an automobile, you have to make sure that uh, the automobile um, build is not going to kill people on the street. So um, there is plenty of um, standards which were created to just avoid malfunction. And the most prominent um, of that uh, one of that is um, the ISO 26262, which is um, a specialization of the IEC 61508 standard for automotive. Um, and the goal of this standard is to avoid malfunction, which is important. Um, and it actually avoids hazardous malfunction. So everything which is uh, going to harm people um, and there is um, this hazard will actually lead to you to a link, which actually will take you down a rabbit hole of functional safety. There is two standards which are often uh, cited in tandem with it, and one is actually the um, so-called SOTIF safety of the intended function, and this is about a working system. So this is not about preventing malfunction, but about keeping up functioning systems. And there's also um, the cybersecurity um, standard, which is uh, also by S um, the ISO. So there's a specific part of that standard for software. And basically this is about documentation of your development process, documentation of your testing process, documentation of your decisions. So that actually when there is something happens, and you get into a lawsuit that you are able to actually verify and present a material which shows that you have done your um, uh, actually what was due and considered everything fine. So um, 
the previously mentioned um, Society of Automotive Engineers, um, which is now called SAE International. Um, it also hosts a task force um, to create uh, a standard on how to use Rust in a functional safe environment. And um, this task force uh, is active. And right now we are actually contributing ISO 26262 for use within Rust. Um, just to the name in SAE International, um, it's um, a volunteer-based organization. It has roughly 400, um, 140K members. Um, and since it also um, created standards for aerospace, it renamed itself from Society of Automotive Engineers to SAE International. So that would actually bring up a short wish list of what actually we are waiting for within the uh, Rust development. Everything which helps with uh, actually the Linux kernel and embassy. So everything which avoids um, memory allocation helps a lot. Um, yeah, and I have a personal uh, proposal about uh, how to actually handle more explicit ones. And I would like to actually hand over to Florian for the second, third. Can you just advance the slides for me when I tell you? Yep. Yeah, thanks. So um, keeping it short, um, in the interest of time, I uh, wanted to also quickly tell how like this first scene thing that we've been talking about factors into this. And if you skip ahead, so what is ferrocene? Ferrocene is a high assurances downstream of the Rust compiler quality managed. I'll talk about what that is in a second. Um, you'll have noticed that ferrocene is closed source and there's a number of reasons for it, particularly that we're working on additional proprietary targets where the whole discussion with how to, how is this going to be released, is going to be upstream and all of these kind of things have to be discussed with a vendor because there's multiple operating systems that are used in the automotive market and it's very common that they're still all proprietary and considered protected information but what is one of the main uh, activities here that's extended testing for specific configurations and in this kind of setting a configuration is not only this compiler on this target but also all the flags that we're allowing users to use. So we need to check um, for um, and to test the compiler's behavior um, with all of those combinations. So the test matrix can become quite big and probably infeasible for the Rust uh, upstream project. And on top of that, a long-term support organization because cars are driving around the, the streets for quite long in the term of decades and the um, car vendors want support for that. Okay. Let's skip ahead. And, and, and so what is quality management? Quality management ensures to customers that they have a good understanding of the tool's quality. So that means also highlighting problematic areas. Like this feature isn't well understood, take care, um, take additional care around it and all of these kind of things. Um, so it's not the question of like, not only answering the question of is this tool of high quality, but also why and how do we make sure that, for example, if issues come up, um, that we inform you just, for example, as an information how that works. If in the upstream compiler, there's an issue popping up with miscompilation, it is not only um, collaborating on a fix, but it's also how do we make sure that everyone who has been using a compiler that might be affected by this miscompilation, where it may introduce bugs, um, is being informed, and that's basically the service. So it gives a support framework um, that allows informing customers and fixing issues fast. Um, also means we need to explain why features are there, how they are implemented, and how they are tested. That is a huge part of what's called compiler qualification, so presenting an understanding on what the compiler does and, um, and yeah, and how it's tested. So you need a, you need to be able to trace from requirements to testing, um, similar as it was discussed before. Uh, okay, 
you can skip. Um, so the question here is like, how is the Ferrocene project beneficial also with the Rust project? Um, there has not been a lot of activity upstream yet. Um, but for example, there's a number of pull requests around uh, test suit improvements, test runners. Um, so for example, there's a lot of specific hardware. Um, I posted on Twitter a couple of months ago a picture of a um, reference board for an ECU and engine control unit. And for example, we have um, finalized support for um, running our test harness on that. That's upstreamed documentation. Um, we have a major announcement in the coming weeks. Um, we want to, if possible, to upstream targets uh, for um, operating systems that are in easily accessible, for example, that can be quite interesting. And well, fixes for any kind of problems found. So this is mainly a quality assurance project currently with a very, very spe specific target audience. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. You want to continue? Oh, last thing that I wanted to mention. Um, for a lot of details around this and how this whole management works, there's an interview on Rustation Station that came out last week uh, with Quentin Achim from our joint venture partner, Adacore, and, and me. Um, where we're going into the detail of what actually this kind of this quality management idea means. Yeah. That's it. And there is also the um, video from the Rust formal verification group on YouTube, which I recommend. Yeah. So uh, just to wrap it up, so. Um, I can say AutoZAR is de facto a standard operating system for automotive, so it's important. And you can already use Rust by wrapping the C++ API, although it's uh, not that uh, um, easy to do now. now. And we consider Rust suited for safety requirements. Uh, there's ongoing work on actually creating standards documents, which are uh, actually heavily asked for uh, in my company. And Ferrocene is doing the compiler qualification, which is actually handling or addressing the second most asked question. And of course, there's uh, additional work which uh, needs to be done on libraries and uh, yeah, an async future implementation. Thank you. I believe you muted first. Oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> I've been talking for a few seconds there. Um, all right, so uh, just, just wrapping up here, our next meeting uh, date is on uh, June 20th. We're going to be figuring out what time of day would be uh, best for this. Uh, the theme is global, so as always, submit uh, any issues with any suggestions of anything that could fit within this theme. Um, and finally, uh, we can move over to the social hour. So if you have any questions uh, for any of the speakers or just want to, to hang out and chat, uh, then definitely make sure to join us for that. Um, we will see you next time.